This podcast episode was made possible in part with support from Sacred Rights, a Henry Luce Foundation-funded project hosted by Northeastern University that promotes public scholarship on religion. I highly recommend you learn more about Sacred Rights on their website, sacred-rights.org, that's W-R-I-T-E-S, or find Sacred Rights on Twitter at sacred underscore rights. Welcome to Classical Ideas. This is Greg Soden. The ways in which sexuality and religion are interconnected in societies across the globe are endlessly fascinating for many reasons, for good, for bad, and somewhere in between. The sex scandals involving clergy, whether it involves sexual orientation of clergy, eloping, and more, is a long-discussed topic in various religious communities, and documenting that history is a complex work that historians work hard to convey through rigorous historical documentation. My guest on this episode does such work. Dr. Susanna Kravulskia is Assistant Professor of History at California State San Marcos, where she teaches courses in U.S. and digital history. She received her Ph.D. in history from the University of Notre Dame. She specializes in modern U.S. history and studies the relationship between sexuality and religion. In this episode, we discuss her current book project, tentatively titled Disgraced, How Sex Scandals Transformed American Protestantism, which investigates how pastoral sex scandals have been covered in the popular press and how Protestant denominations and the reading public responded to the coverage. We also discuss her published articles from the Journal of American Studies, Current Research in Digital History, and the Journal of the Gilded Age and Progressive Era. Links to readings can be found in the show notes. You can find Dr. Susanna Kravulskia on Twitter at S-U-Z-Z-Z-A-N-N-A, and you can find Sacred Rights on Twitter at Sacred underscore Rights. You can follow me on Twitter at Classical underscore Ideas. Without further delay, please enjoy my conversation with Dr. Susanna Kravulskia. Dr. Susanna Kruvulskia, welcome to Classical Ideas. Thanks so much for having me, Greg. I am delighted to have you. I'm ready to fall into a fantastic conversation about all of your areas of interest and expertise and your research. If you can just go ahead and maybe spend a moment and introduce yourself a little bit to the audience so they know who you are and what you do. Sure. Uh, I'm an assistant professor of history at California State University San Marcos, which is on the traditional territories of the Lusenio people. And in my research, I explore the relationship between the histories of religion and sexuality in modern U.S. history. Uh, at Cal State San Marcos, I also teach in various areas, um, including U.S. surveys, gender, religion, sexuality, and digital history. Wonderful. Well, I'm curious about these different areas of academic interests that you have. I always like to unpack the backstory of people's work and like follow the, the stepping stones of where they go throughout their career and what leads them into those areas of niche expertise, so to speak. Um, so I'm kind of curious about your academic path. Like what are some of your stepping stones that led you down the path that you have traveled to get to this point that you're at today? So I think that like many a lot of what I'm interested in starts sort of autobiographically without being hopefully too self-indulgent. <laughs> but um, I grew up in Minsk, Belarus. I was born in the Soviet Union at the time. And I met some US missionaries um, who were with, at the time, uh, the organization Campus Crusade for Christ. And they sort of were really formative um, in my middle school and high school years to the point where I then went to college um, to study theology. And it was a small liberal arts uh, Christian college in Lithuania. And there I had some questions <laughs> about what the, the, the Protestant missionaries had, had taught me and what I had sort of accepted as, um, you know, the ultimate truth. 
And so researching and writing from a more academic point of view, I decided to switch lives and careers. And I uh, got into Yale Divinity School where I got my first master's degree. And there I focused on women's gender and sexuality studies as a way to sort of transition from a more theological approach to a more historical approach. Um, and I was really lucky that my years at Yale intersected with one of my mentors and now friends, uh, the great historian, Catherine Lofton, who had these really interesting ideas about the relationship between religion and sexuality and how the secular is not at all secular and, and how consumerism is part of our experience. Anyway, I, I got really, really interested in the um, in the academic study of these subjects. And so I then, well, for two years, I didn't do anything academic per se. I worked at the, at the Yale Child Study Center. But then after that, uh, I got into a PhD program at Washington University in St. Louis, where I was lucky enough to work with a historian there, uh, Darren Dochuk. And they also have a really cool center on religion and politics, the John C. Danforth Center, and a bunch of just wonderful people whose work I had read and admired Marie Griffith, Lee Schmidt, Lori Mathley Kipp, Lerone Martin. All these people were there to kind of nurture my, my first years, years of the PhD program. And then Darren got a job at Notre Dame, and all of his students were given the choice to stay or leave and go with him. And all four of us and our little variations of families followed him to Indiana. And so I got my, I finished my degree at Notre Dame in 2019. And then, you know, before the world went to hell, got an academic job, which is a, a great, great luxury here at Cal State. Absolutely. Well, and really funny, uh, the way that our lives overlap a little bit in that regard is that I'm actually from St. Louis, born and raised, and uh, many of my my best friends actually were students at Wash U. Um, yeah. So, you know, I know that area very well right there along Skinker across from Forest Park in <laughs> St. Louis. And uh, what a delight to have that in common with you. Some of our, you know, experiences overlap, like walk in the loop, you know, that whole yeah. entire area, U yeah. City, absolutely wonderful. Do you have good memories of your time in St. Louis? I really do. Um, although, and also, I was there uh, when Michael Brown was killed. Mm. Um, and so I was there during the protests. And, and I really learned a lot through that about the place. I was actually also dating um, somebody at the time who was from Florissant, which is right next door to Ferguson. And so I learned a lot through that, like being with somebody who, who, who really knew the place. And so St. Louis is very complicated, mm -hmm. uh, but it's, uh, I, yeah, I have nothing but, you know, fond memories of my time there. I think there's great work being done um, by historians to excavating this, this very complicated very yeah. segregated city, very complicated path. Absolutely. Well, and you being in St. Louis, you're right there on that Del Mar dividing line where the racial demographics totally shift from the north to the south side of the city. I mean, it's right there, blocks Precisely. from Wash U. And, you know, what's so funny about that is I have a friend who was a UCC minister during the exact events that you were just talking about around Michael Brown, and that was his first weekend mm -hmm. in his first pastoring job at the United Church of Christ. And the stories that he told me about that experience of being a faith leader in this community that he was brand new to were so jarring. You know, it's yeah. it's really uh, quite quite interesting and just extremely tragic. But yeah. I'm I'm glad that you had a good time in the city of my of my childhood. Wonderful. Yeah, thank you. Well, you know, before we dive into your work more specifically, I want to talk a little bit about sacred rights the organization that you are currently doing a, a fellowship for based on the how important it is for scholars to bring their work and expertise to a wider public audience. And that is one of my favorite things about this show is having professors and scholars and historians on the show to distill their work into conversations that anybody in the world can appreciate because I, as a high school teacher, um, always am just very fascinated by that. And so, you know, these converging interests that you've had and this scholarly path that you've walked uh, finds you a member of the 2020 cohort for sacred rights. 
And I'm wondering if you can tell me a little bit about why you applied to this fellowship and what sorts of skills you are currently working on as a member of the current cohort. Yeah, well, the, the first skill would be to to even to begin to think of myself as an expert in mm-hmm. anything. And Megan Goodwin and Liz Buca are so great at kind of trying to convince us, the, the cohort members, that we are in fact experts in our field and that we should claim that expertise and participate uh, in public conversations. And so I applied because I think there's not enough translation across you know, historical expertise and what people actually read and what people actually care about. There's more of it now than there was even, you know, 10, 20 years ago. But part of the problem there on the other side of that coin is that I, for one, find that there's sometimes um, an arrogance that comes with this expertise. And you can see this perhaps most most clearly on Twitter uh, when historians take on various <laughs> um, actors <laughs> uh, and, and, and like beat them over the head with their expertise. And, and you know that approach to me just seems so counterproductive and um, self indulgent um, mm. in many ways. So so my goal to, with this training is is to kind of find this middle path of you know how do we translate quote unquote expertise into something that people care about and something that perhaps uh, can bring up interesting new questions for them without also being um, hiding behind the arrogance of our degrees. Mm. And I found, you know, to that end, the, the experience really, really productive. And I also just think some of my form- most formative experiences have been when I was thrown into like a weird group of people for a week at a time and you know had it not been for the pandemic we would be meeting in person of course um and i think those just tend to be really fun and deeply strange but then those those uh, connections you know continue to inform my work and my friendships and so being a part of a community that's intentional about something for like a limited period of time and is really intense about it. I just find it really fulfilling for whatever reason. Yeah. I, I think about how I really wanted to go to the teacher training at the uh, religious literacy project at Harvard, mm-hmm. like so badly for high school teachers to get together and talk about how do we talk about religion? How do we teach about religion in public schools? I mean, that that's, those are the conversations that I feel like that's where I belong and the fact that I haven't been able to do it because of this, I know exactly mm. that feeling and how heartbreaking it is. What are some of the skills that you feel like you've been really sharpening? Have you found yourself improving in any specific areas uh, within your work after having been a member of the cohort? I haven't gotten to practice as many, as in like I haven't yet published an op-ed or an explainer, uh, but I'm doing this podcast interview, which is great. Um, but, I, but I've but i been given a toolkit that I plan to go back to time and again. Uh, Megan and Liz are so great at very succinctly emphasizing the the things that scholars need to be (laughs) working toward and sort of foregoing some of the things that we learned in our training that is good for scholarly work but just does not work when we try to communicate with the broader public. Yeah. And, you know, and if you, if you really think about it, I mean, the, the possibilities are limitless. Like as a high school teacher myself, I actually assign Dr. Bucar's work Mm -hmm. on fashion, like from the Atlantic, like my students read those pieces, you know? So there are people around there around the world, like myself who have positions where they can disseminate this work to 30 people at a time in a classroom, Mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. So having a 12th grade class read a piece about um, Muslim women's fashion is really amazing because it broadens 30 minds all at once on one piece of writing. And you never know how many of those pieces are being read all over the country. It's just so cool. I love this organization so much. Yeah, yeah, So I love that you are um, into uh, the the research area of um, ministerial sexual conduct. Can you tell me a little bit about how you got interested in the co- in the topics around ministerial sexual conduct in general before we go more, more specific? You know, again, back to the autobiographical, as I was sort of grappling with issues of theology and conservative religion and sexuality in college, um, 
it was right at the time that the Ted Haggard scandal happened. So mm. 2006, Ted Haggard, who's this big name in evangelical uh, Christianity, he is the president of the National Association of Evangelicals. And this um, escort, male escort from Denver comes out and says, I've been seeing this guy for, for a year. He's been my client. We've engaged in you know, a sexual relationship and he's also purchased crystal meth from me. And mm. so the evangelical community is outraged. Um, and then young Susanna is in Lithuania trying to figure out, oh, so like when that happens, right? What does that mean? What does that mean for, for, for the theology of that group? What does that mean for religion more broadly? What does that mean for the way that the public perceives religion and, and this particular form of religion? And so I think, you know, from, from then on, I knew I wanted to do something broadly with sexuality and religion. Um, and then narrowing down the project for my dissertation, I decided to, you know, why not survey the sort of greatest hits of sex scandals involving Protestant ministers across time and, and then see what I find. What was it about Protestantism particularly that, that drew you into to that particular focus? Well, part of it was that I knew it the best uh, personally at one point, uh, no longer a part of the group, but um, some of it is this firsthand knowledge. Some of it was uh, figuring out the parameters of a project that would be manageable within a dissertation format. You know, you only have a couple of years to write it. Um, another interesting part is that actually I thought about expanding it to all kinds of sex, religious sex scandals and maybe doing a shorter time frame. But I was quickly uh, alerted to the fact that Catholic archives, for example, uh, or at least the ones I've tried to get into, were not open for research on that particular topic. Mm. Um, and this is not surprising. This is, you know, during the Catholic sex abuse, quote unquote, crisis. Um, maybe we'll, we'll get to talk about whether or not it's a crisis here in a minute. But um, yeah, I, I, I emailed uh, an archivist. I won't name the institution. And I was told that despite the fact that these records, these were like um, ministerial uh, uh, misconduct records, they were from the mid 19th century. And they wouldn't <laughs> like, surely we're over. <laughs> you know, it's been a few years. Let me look yeah. at the stuff. But they wouldn't. So Part of it was that um, accessibility down. Yeah. Yeah. Being, you have to be able to see the things in front of your eyes <laughs> in order to, uh, to research and write about it, you know, without access to the archives, you're kind of hitting your head against mm -hmm. the brick wall. Um, you wrote a piece in 2020 for the revealer called a history of sex abuse in the Protestant imagination. And I was very captivated, um, by this article which frames uh, sex abuse in a way that reframes the problem for me, which you just alluded to just a moment ago. And it's often said that you know, sex abuse within religious congregations is a crisis, but you tended to you tend to categorize it differently. Can you talk to me a little bit about what you think about it? Yeah, that idea of um, in the case of Catholics. Um, of this being a crisis is not my own. I should give credit to the wonderful historian, Robert Orsi, who calls it the Catholic normal, right? Which is a similar argument to what I'm making for Protestants. Um, I think that when we look at the long history of, you know, in my case, scandals, which is how I get at issues of abuse, what we see within Protestantism is that it's an ongoing issue we just haven't called it abuse until very recently. For example, you know, in the Gilded Age progressive era, we have people, uh, Protestant ministers eloping or running off with girls as young as 12 and 13 who are members of their congregation. Now, nobody called that abuse. This was a, a scandal. Um, but when applying kind of contemporary understandings of age and sexuality and, and these categories, does this look like abuse to us? And I think that it might, um, you know, I'm not going to strongly come out and say one way or the other, because of course there's historical contingency and, and, and different conceptions of age at that time. But nonetheless, you know, if, if we apply that lens and look back into the past, there's nothing crisis-y about this. This has been an ongoing story uh, that is 
you know, I think endemic to a lot of communities, not just religious communities, as Megan Goodwin um, argues in her book. Mm. So I'm getting the sense that, you know, as a historian, you tend to, you know, sort of couch yourself very specifically and very carefully when looking at issues like this. So instead of, you know, just running around and waving your arms in the air and screaming crisis, 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 you tend to have a much different approach as a historian. Can you talk a little bit about that? Um, that so, I don't know if the conservative approach is the right way of doing it, but like maybe that would be something worth commenting on as well about how you come at this from such a a cautious and careful approach. Right. The problem of anachronisms, right, is one that historians deal with. So the biggest example in my fields of religion, sexuality, or, or LGBTQ history is these lay categ- categories that we now use and have appropriated do not necessarily apply to people to people's experiences in the 19th or even early 20th centuries. And of course, Michel Foucault is the the the, the guy that told us if um, it was not until the late 19th century that a homosexual emerged as like a species, right? Mm. Um, and I think that I keep that in mind because I understand from everything I've read and researched that people are not the same across time and, and place, that, that, our, that the, our circumstances are uh, both kind of physical conditions, but are also discursive regimes that we occupy shape our personhood and our understanding of ourselves in the world. So, so the experience of that girl who eloped with her pastor in 1878 is vastly different from an experience of a girl who's being abused today. Mm. Um, and, and we must account for that. And it's, and it's a frustrating exercise because I think people want more clarity and more sort of black and white answers and um, examples from the past that apply neatly to today. But, but I contend that we just can never get there because people change. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, you know, I had Dr. Brian Kleitz and Dr. Tia Pratt mm-hmm. on Classical Ideas in the past, and we talked about abuse problems and, you know, essentially the normal term that you talked about just now within the Catholic Church. And Dr. Megan Goodwin, who you also mentioned, has appeared on the show as well to talk about abuse and sex, where we talked about Mormon fundamentalism, Islam, and Satanism. And so this is really fascinating to have you here as well, because you are, you know, talking about a slightly different lane of scholarship, if you will. And you mentioned it's the normal, just like how Orsi calls it the Catholic normal. Is the scale of abuse within Protestant congregations um, very large? Um, Is it something that is essentially everywhere? Can you tell us a little bit about what you're seeing um, with regards to the problem today in 2021? I would venture to say that it's a huge problem. That said, again, as a historian who who, who mostly looks at the past, you know, I'm not going to make any grand uh, claims here, but we do have evidence, right? So we have um, the great uh, sex advice columnist and podcaster Dan Savage has run a ongoing column called Youth Pastor Watch, in which he documents various crimes of sexual nature, of which Protestant youth pastors have been um, accused for, for many, many years. We have these reports coming out from mega churches and, and from smaller churches of the scale of abuse within Protestant congregations that is not only sort of, I think the thing that's interesting about Protestant is, uh, Protestants is that the abuse uh, that happens is not just in the realm of sort of physical acts. I would I would venture to say that it's also in the ways that some Protestant theologies of sexuality instill into their followers ideas about uh, what it is to 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 be godly with regard to their sexuality. And that too is harmful. So maybe it's not abuse in the sense that we have come to think of it as kind of physical, um, but it's certainly 
traumatizing um, and it's certainly abusive. Actually, my, my friend uh, William Boyce just had an article published in the Open Access Journal of Religions where he talks about the, the kind of abuse that happens when, as a queer person, for example, within evangelical communities, you're being told that everything about you is wrong, right? Mm -hmm. So, so that's another scale. I just, I just want to add to the conversation within Protestantism. Not only is it big, and we're just recently beginning to learn about it, but there's also this underlying through line that that condemns certain sexualities, and that too, I would argue, is abusive. I'm really excited that you mentioned that just now as well, because I'm actually going to have a conversation later in the week with uh, Lynn Gerber, a fellow mm -hmm. cohort member who writes about the experiences of um, gay and lesbian people within San Francisco who are Christian and in same-sex relationships and the paths traveled. So mm -hmm. there's so much fascinating work being done to document these stories, and it's just wonderful. But I'm curious about if American Protestantism has escaped scrutiny in any way, um, escaped attention that might be needed in order to solve these problems, while other traditions like Islam or Mormon fundamentalism, as Megan Goodwin writes, tend to attract all the heat, all the public scrutiny gets put on these um, small groups. But there's this large problem that you're writing about that's right in front of everybody's eyes, essentially. Why have I heard so much more about abuse in other traditions as opposed to American Protestantism? Is this like a massive sort of sweeping <laughs> under the rug? Yeah, so part of it is just historically Protestantism has been the religion of the majority, right? They, you know, it was kind of the default faith of the nation. And so when uh, representatives of other religions, including Catholics and Mormons, begin to either arrive or emerge within the nation, uh, one of the first things they're accused of are inappropriate sexual arrangements. And, and so Protestants kind of um, elevate themselves to the point of this is how things should be. And all these other faiths are not practicing sexuality appropriately. And in that way, they, they, they become almost um, immune to accusations of abuse. Mm. That's, that's, I think, a large part of it. I mean, this is a, you know, for better or worse, a historically majority Protestant story here in the U.S. Interesting. Well, you know, the history of covering scandal in journalism is covered throughout some of your other work as well. Um, you have an article called The Itinerant Passions of Protestant Pastors in the Journal of the Gilded Age and Progressive Era, which I also found interesting. And I want to know about the history of covering stories of sexual abuse in American religion. Like, what are the differences in how these stories are covered in the media today versus maybe some other points in the past few centuries? Yeah, um, so I, the book projects, the project that I'm working on starts in the 1830s with the press revolution. So this is when newspapers become accessible and this is when human interest stories for the first time begin to be published uh, and people can't get enough. This is a huge industry very quickly, but Still, because of the kind of conservative religious influence of Protestantism, even the most uh, successful kind of gossipy publications at the time, and so this is still the 1830s, are very careful about what they print because they believe, and here's how people are different in the past, right? They believe that the things that you read, if you read about corruption, you will become corrupt. So if you don't know about the horrible stories happening around you, you're purer and you're better off. Okay, so, interesting the, approach yeah. there. <laughs> right. So just like let's not talk about this, and then you will not. How be about that logic? By the news. Right. They slowly begin to embrace the genre of scandal uh, by around the 1870s. That's when it becomes uh, more respectable to cover. Uh, to cover these stories. And it has to do with this, the biggest uh, celebrity preacher trial of the 19th century 
Henry Ward Beecher uh, being accused of seducing his one of his best friend's wives. Mm. Um, and so, so this is when the press kind of allows itself slowly <laughs> to begin to, to take scandal seriously. And then churches respond. In the early 20th century, there are efforts um, at better church publicity. Protestant denominations reach out to newspaper editors saying like, please just stop only covering the bad stuff that is happening with our ministers. Can you also talk about some of the good stuff? And I think, you know, we arrive where we are today or where I'll probably end the book in the 80s and 90s. There is such an oversaturation um, of stories that are sensational that it kind of loses its edge to where we know, you know, scandals happen every day or every other day. And so people almost become um, desensitized to the, to the stark sensationalism that would have been uh, really shocking earlier on. Mm. I want to know more about Henry Ward Beecher, um, but, you know, we'll get to that in a second. Uh, has there been any documented history of like denominations f- sort of throwing each under each other under the bus where one de- denomination seeks to maintain some kind of supremacy in numbers and reports other denominations to the media in order to get the other folks bad press so that they might then benefit from like butts and seats, as it's called in the church. Um, Was there any strife between congregations who were looking for congregants during the early times of what you're looking at in your research? Certainly. And actually, Henry Ward Beecher would be one example of this. Uh, But there's an earlier one. So in the the 30s, the first case I I cover in the book um, is of this Methodist minister, Ephraim Avery, uh, who gets accused of seducing and what they mean by that is having sex with and then murdering a pregnant um, young factory worker. Goodness. Yeah. Um, So it's a case about both, you know, a sex scandal, sort of, it's largely about the murder. And the Methodists at the time are a young denomination, newcomers to, to the U.S. And more traditional denominations do not like them because precisely because they, you know, draw huge crowds. They have this more emotional style of camp meetings. There's potentially shady things sexually going on. Um, And so more traditional denominations in their coverage of the case of Avery uh, blame Methodism and say, how can they stand behind him? How can they, you know, sanction this kind of abuse? They They don't call it abuse, but they really make it a point to not just look at it as a case of, you know, one bad egg, but rather, no, the entire denomination is guilty. Just look at what they're doing. We get to the 70s, 1870s, a similar thing happens in the Beecher trial. Beecher is a Congregationalist, very well-established Brooklyn family. Uh, His father is this big revivalist too. Harry Beecher Stowe is obviously. A, I was going to say people author. probably, yeah, people probably <laughs> right. remember the word, the name Beecher. Yeah. So, and he is truly he's a celebrity. I mean, people. There's anecdotes of like people asking, "How do we get to Beecher's Church on Sunday?" And other people telling them, "Oh, you get off the ferry in Brooklyn, and then you just follow the crowds, right? That's nice. how that's how famous he is." Um, and so when he gets accused, and there was an internal church trial. Of course, he gets acquitted because everybody loves Beecher. Um, There's a trial, a a civic trial in a Brooklyn court where the room is so packed, nobody can get tickets to it. But other denominations and other newspapers begin to say the Congregationalists must say something. They cannot just stand idly by. They must, you know, condemn Beecher's actions here. And they don't. And Beecher ends up uh, acquitted. Well, there's a hung jury. He ends up serving and retiring comfortably in his Brooklyn church. Meanwhile, the guy who accused him becomes this um, outcast, moves to Paris. The woman with whom Beecher was supposed to have had the affair becomes a recluse, doesn't allow newspapers into her house until she dies because of how the publicity traumatized her. So again, it's a, you know, it's a story of power, et cetera. But anyway, that's a, all tangential. You were asking about denomination. Absolutely. 
right? Yeah. Scandals are used at least in the 19th century. I don't have really great examples of this in the 20th, but in the 19th century, for sure, to, to sort of, no, no, look at the larger denomination. There's a problem with it. Mm. Do you, when, when do you, do you see any evidence of when denominational congregations started to sort of stand up against uh, leaders who were being accused of things? Like, is there like a shift in, in congregant mood or is it like always like they're, they're sort of like backing the leaders? How does that look? This is a part of my research that's frustrating because it's really hard to get at. So how do you evaluate the impact of scandal on a congregation? Well, you could look at church numbers or membership numbers, but those fluctuate. And just because something goes down doesn't necessarily mean that they left, for example, because of a scandal. So I'm left with this perpetual dissatisfaction <laughs> of being <laughs> unable to account for the kind of precise nature of, of how this all plays out. So I'm afraid I don't have a satisfying answer for you. But there's certainly, you know, I think too with Protestantism and how it's different from some of the other religions that we've already mentioned. So for example, Catholicism, Protestants take pride in the fact that there's, you know, this direct access to God, that the preacher is just this, this sort of almost um, unnecessary part, right? It's not like the Pope. They're, they're always saying, oh, right. those Catholics worship the Pope. We don't. We have unmitigated access. And so to that end, they don't scrutinize that figure, the figure of the pastor as much. But also at the same time, the figure of the pastor often becomes this venerated, almost worshipped, charismatic person for whom many of the congregants will stand up and defend regardless of the evidence um, of abuse or, or scandal. So it's a really interesting dynamic of both sort of eschewing ideas about um, anybody's spiritual superiority, but also really being enchanted with figures of charismatic pastors. Yeah. And you know, it's really interesting as well too, because I know that you're, as a historian, you have to be so cautious about making claims. Mm -hmm. So just because there is some kind of, uh, you know, documented abuse or some kind of documented um, accusation just because there are defections, unless you have evidence that the people leaving said it on the record, I'm leaving because X, Y, Z, it's kind of irresponsible to make those claims. Does that, does that make sense? I wish you had been at my dissertation defense because that's one of the questions that came up that, I, that truly I just cannot find those claims. And that, it's unfortunate. That may be one of the nicest things anybody's ever said to me on this show. Um, <laughs> what a nerdy really, thing, too. <laughs> I love it. That really made me feel wonderful just now. You know, so I'm curious about today. Let's go back to the present day, sort of. Um, what are some changes that we're observing before our very eyes regarding the changes in progress towards fighting against sex abuse within American Protestantism? How are we progressing and doing better if we are? I'm not sure that we are doing that much better. There's certainly, you know, the the Me Too movement has inspired a specific religious movement, the Church Too movement. And we've seen many brave men and women um, stand up and speak to journalists about the abuse, their experiences of abuse. Um, and that's new, right? People coming out in, in large numbers to speak about it. We also have uh, one of Billy Graham's grandsons who's now saying that much of Protestant theology enables abuse because there's so little supervision and there is such an enchantment. Again, kind of what I was saying with the charismatic authority of the preacher. Um, so that's great. And he actually, so his name is uh, Boz Chavidian and he, he started a network to help victims of abuse within uh, specifically Protestant evangelical denominations. So there's more publicity, there's more coverage, there's more resources for victims. I'm not sure that theologically uh, there are changes that are being made or even structurally. I think there's still, unfortunately, much as with as with make two movements, there's this uh, networks of secrecy and protection for the people up top. You know, and some of them, even when accused credibly, will never face the consequences. 
You know, when I'm thinking about how evidence is going to be so prevalent within like digital mediums, like I think about like the film, the police movements and things like that to where there's going to be cameras and recording devices being used so much more commonly in all areas of human life that that's going to be some things that are going to start coming out as well, you know? I hope so. Certainly yeah. Hope so. You know, another topic that you write about that I'm very interested in is uh, regarding queer religion and historiographies of non-straight people within American Protestantism. And I'm curious uh, specifically about the concept of straight washing, but also silencing. I'm curious if you can comment on what people sh out there should know about um, about these concepts within American Protestantism. Yeah, so this is uh, coming out of the stuff in the dissertation that I couldn't quite put together um, in a coherent way. And so I made an article out of it. And, and, and this article should be coming out in a couple of months from the journal uh, Religion and American Culture. And there I look at the long history of accusations of queerness against Protestant ministers through the 20th century and the ways in which churches went from silencing those, the accusers, or dismissing pastors in the early 20th century to really shielding them. Uh, and here I'm thinking in particular about people like um, Jim Baker and Jimmy Swaggart at the end of the 20th century. Uh, so there's attempts at internally shielding them from these accusations. And then there is what I call you know, straight washing, which is really fascinating. Another piece I'm working on right now, which is the way in which the scorned wives of these preachers credibly accused of various ways of being queer or queer acts come out to their defense and testify to their straightness. So Tammy Faye Baker, for example, in multiple um, iterations, says that, oh no, Jim was a wonderful lover. And he was very, this is after they get divorced, after he gets convicted mm. on fraud, right? But she still feels this need to sort of speak to his straightness in a way that's really, I think, surprising. But the larger intervention of that piece too, in particular, was to, you know, the historiography of, of LGBTQ sexualities has, is very new, A. And B, I think, a lot of the early researchers wanted to kind of go back into the archives and find queer heroes. Whereas the men I'm looking at, um, and they're all men, tend to not be so heroic, right? Some of these people are the very people who denounce homosexuality from, from the pulpit and then get caught up in a queer sex scandal. And so part of my intervention there is to say that our uh, research into areas of sort of marginalized communities such as LGBTQ communities need to also account for what I call queer villains. Mm. I find that to be such an interesting topic because, you know, there, I, I'm not going to get into specific names or anything, but politicians who mm -hmm. are in the closet, so to speak, and are voting against LGBTQ plus rights within legislation that impact people's day-to-day -day lives when you know those those kinds of laws would would serve to protect the exact person voting against it if they were out and living you know their authentic life um it's really painful to to consider mm -hmm. the uh the silencing and the the straight washing and all that it's just such a complex story and topic and it's so confusing and i find myself thinking about that often. So I'm glad that you're writing about it. And yeah. I'm looking forward to that piece in particular, um, whenever it comes out. And I hope Thank that people you. will find it. Um, yeah. You know, I'm, I'm also curious about these queer preachers and pastors, and how they get caught up like in the, if there's like a machine of American Protestant churches, and how they respond to, um, you know, pastors who are Incredibly accused of, um, you know, non heteronormative lifestyles and sexualities. I'm curious if there has been a shift in acceptance or um, if they've gone from con condemned within their church leadership positions to more accepted. How's that 
changing for people in pastoral leadership roles within American Protestant churches? Yeah, and here I should say that uh, I'm mostly talking about conservative evangelical Protestants. Okay. There's a number of mainline uh, denominations who are open and affirming, who have sure. queer pastors, and, and so this is a non-issue for them, right? So I'm talking about a very specific kind of subgroup of Protestants. Perfect um, distinction. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. You know, your, your listeners might not, you know, um, catch on. So that's important to note here. Uh, you know, in the, in the early 20th century, there is an attempt to shield, to, to sort of handle, and again, because this is the moment in which churches are realizing we're in trouble, we're getting a lot of really bad press. So how can we help ourselves out and do some good PR work? Uh, and so with, there's a lot of secrecy, there's a lot of kind of uh, closed door church trials or sending off um, a, an accused minister to do something else for a while to kind of have it um, quiet down. And that tendency really persists. There is an understanding that bad publicity results in, um, you know, diminishing numbers. And so, for example, when uh, Jim Baker has a scandal in the 80s, the first impulse is for, for these ministers to help him. Um, and then they turn on him because they realize they're not going to be able to help him precisely when accusations of queerness come into play. So they, they could have dealt with the straight scandal, but not so much with, the. Uh, in fact, he gets dismissed from the Assemblies of God for alleged bisexual activity, mm. which of course, that that's too much. Uh, the, the fact that he may have assaulted a woman, uh, that to them is manageable. As soon as it's a little queer, you know, they want to have him deal with it uh, on his own. Mm. I know you have a book project, Disgraced, How Sex Scandals Transformed American Protestantism Under Contract with Oxford University Press, which is fabulous. Um, I'm curious if you can give the audience an overview of what readers can expect from this book, uh, when they can expect it, what kind of, you know, maybe like a, a little preview of some important chapters, maybe some things we haven't talked about. And, you know, just anything you want to say about the book in general. Yeah, I'm thrilled to have it come out with Oxford. Um, I'm a huge fan of, of the other stuff that they put out. So I'm working, so the book is a revised version of the dissertation with, with an expanded conclusion, a new chapter. Um, and it takes you through this story. Um, again, I begin in the 1830s and I talk about the rise of the press um, and how the press, uh, how sex scandal coverage changed kind of three groups of people, uh, how it changed the press itself, how it changed Protestant denominations and how it changed the reading public. And so through all of the case studies, some of which will be these well-known ones like the Henry Ward Beecher or the Amy Semple McPherson disappearance in 1926. Um, some of them are super well-known, others are, I don't think they've ever been written about, uh, but together I kind of weave the story of, of how things change over time and how, how churches respond to negative publicity and how we end up where we are, which to me is a bit of a troubling time precisely because of this kind of desensitized, overwhelmed public that's reading about scandal all the time to the point where we sort of stop caring a little bit because mm -hmm. this is a daily occurrence. Um, so I take the reader all the way through and, and show these changes. I'm very excited about the book. When can they expect that? Do you have a publication date yet? No. Well, I have a date when it's due to the editor, which is not for a while. I, I asked for a bit of time just because my teaching schedule is heavy. Um, it should possibly be coming out in early 2023. Cool. So two years from now. Look Fabulous. Well, that's so great. And you have so many other articles out as well where people can you know, read and see what you're up to based on the work of the dissertation and, you know, sort of start the process of familiarizing themselves with what you've already been up to mm -hmm. before the book comes out, which is fabulous. Yeah. What is your research and writing agenda for the next couple of years? Do you have any projects besides the book that you have sort of in the pipeline that you're thinking about? I'm thinking about or mulling over some ideas. Um, right now, the energy is going to be going to the book 
Uh, but beyond that, I'm really, I'm a big uh, Broadway nerd. And so if I can figure out a project that has to do with Broadway and religion in some way, that could be interesting. That's one thing I want to pursue. And the other idea I have is much more grim than that. Um, but I'm interested in the way that religion, U.S. religions have thought about the problem of suicide. Mm. And so a kind of American religious history of suicide would be another um, another potential project. But again, I, these are just baby ideas at this point. Little tiny nuggets. I love yeah. that you have a very positive idea and then a grim idea because <laughs> yeah. I feel like those can like, you know, counterbalance because writing about um, American history of suicide within religion is so important, mm -hmm. but so emotionally taxing for the writer. You know, does that, does that project make you nervous at all? Like feeling like I, I feel like I kind of have to do this project, but I know it's going to take so much out of me. Does that worry you at all? Yeah, well, there's that. There's the kind of self-preservation, but there's also, obviously this is a subject of people who have lost people to suicide, for example, would be like potentially traumatizing or triggering to read about, which is why I would take a very, um, this is again where history helps because we're writing about people in far away times, right? Yeah. Um, so that would be my approach. I don't, I don't know that I'll pursue it, but, but it's something that I'm really interested in. And I don't think anybody has written about really. So wonderful. Well, Dr. Susanna Kravolskia, this has been a very wonderful conversation. I am so delighted that we were able to spend this hour together talking about your work, talking about the fantastic work that Sacred Rights is doing, talking about your book project. I'm wondering if you can tell people where they can find you if they want to follow your progress and your scholarship in the coming days. Where can they find you if they want to know more? Yeah, I have a website, Um, I also am an active Twitter participant, although I will warn people that it's like half nerdy academic things and half you know, real housewives means. Um, I, I like my garbage reality TV as much as I, as I like intellectual pursuits. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for coming on Classical Ideas. This has been just a real treat for me. Greg, thank you. And I, I just want to say how much I appreciate the work that you do and, and bringing these voices in conversation with the broader public. And I do hope to hear from some listeners. I'd be, I'd be curious to keep this conversation going. Go find, go find uh, Dr. Kowalski on Twitter, everybody. <laughs> Classical Ideas is produced by me, Greg Soden. Music on Classical Ideas is composed and performed by Derek Strybeck. Support for this episode of Classical Ideas was provided by Sacred Rights, a Henry Luce Foundation project. Explore the work of Sacred Rights at sacred-rights.org.